This is going to be a little bit different, I think, than what you've seen so far, because really this is about um, taking medical device innovation and gearing it towards developing countries so that we can meet their healthcare needs. I think this is fairly critical because uh, in the United States and in other Western countries, when we look to go out and improve healthcare in developing countries, we tend to have a very Western-centric view about doing that. Now, not everybody does this, but we have seen a lot of failures where this takes place. We tend to look at their healthcare needs and their solutions based upon how we do things currently. And that means NGOs will often, with, with great intentions, raise money and send some well-working but retired anesthesia machines out to Ghana, for instance. They'll send an autoclave out. They'll, they'll find a retired surgical light, and they will send those out to developing countries. And it, it's a nice gesture, but in fact, they do not have the infrastructure to support those. If they know how to use it at all and gets used, as soon as it stops functioning because it needs maintenance or repair, it becomes a fixture. A uh, autoclave may become a storage place for the nurse's purses. They may clear the shelf from a laparoscopic tower to be able to put other components in the operating room on, and it lacks the sustainability that we've all been discussing here today. The other method is then to develop devices that we think will meet their needs, and they'll be able to manage in their own setting and supply those to these developing countries by bringing them in with our medical tourists. And this tends not to work in perpetuity either because they lack the ability to actually develop these devices on their own. They, they actually should be able to, to produce, distribute, maintain, and repair their own medical devices. As we continue to give them our technologies and let them use those, we're not doing them a great favor in helping them to build up their infrastructure to help them create jobs as part of this whole process. And the innovation model allows us to do that. Now you can take our standard innovation model for producing medical devices and you just modify it so that it fits the criteria necessary to bring it to developing countries, to bring it outside the United States. Now this requires collaboration. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the nuances that are involved in bringing device innovation to developing countries. But you, you have to recognize that it's all about collaboration. And so Dr. Bob Hitchcock here in, in bioengineering and I have teamed up and we've developed a program called BioInnovate, which is uh, a program that teaches our fellows over a year period of time how to discover unmet clinical needs and then bring them all the way from conception to market. One of our teams, which I'll tell you about shortly, has taken that whole process and they found a way to bring it to the whole concept we've been talking about today, and that is improving quality and affordability and care at a global level. Our Western-centric view tends to um, fail us when we say, let's go fix them and, and let's give them some of the devices we have now. But in fact, this, this concept of tailoring it to their needs three big areas to focus on. One is their infrastructure. Yes, their government. We've not heard a lot about that today, but government is really critical. And then the culture of the people. If we give them something and their culture is counter to its application, as Pauline shared with us today, we're not going to get very far with its implementation. All of you should be able to look at this evening sky map taken from satellite and point out where it is you've done some of your work in these developing countries, and you'll notice that it's black. This is all part of the critical infrastructure when you're going to um, come in and bring in a new technology. If you're bringing in a technology that's got uh, advanced electrical components in the Congo, for instance, where they do not generally have any electricity available, you're not going to be effective with your, with your ability to implement that technology. If the infrastructure of the business climate within that country does not allow them to, to continue with the maintenance and repair of the technologies you're bringing in, again, it's going to sit there and it's going to become, it's going to become a showpiece and device that sits and doesn't get used because they don't have the ability to continue to maintain it. Going down further and looking at the area you're going to be implementing this in, you may run into this middle picture here is a more advanced hospital in Ghana, 
but the right upper corner, sorry, your left upper corner is also a hospital in Ghana. And the bottom right corner is a hospital in Congo that originally was a fairly state-of-the-art hospital, but they didn't have the infrastructure to support, and now it's a shell that's relatively dysfunctional. So even if some of the bigger cities in the countries that you're going to be working in or applying your applications to, do you have some, some facilities that'll be able to maintain the uh, technologies that you want to introduce? You have to understand they may not be able to meet the demands and needs of the entire region. And so you have to tailor your technology to the specific subsegment of that area that you're going to apply it to. And then further down, looking at the actual hospital itself, this, uh, the uh, picture in the upper left is a modern facility that we're, most of us are used to working in. This picture in the center is a woman's health clinic surgical procedure uh, room in, in the Congo that has no electricity. It has a bed that is not functional. And to come in and bring the concept of a robotic surgery to these people, saying this is our most advanced way of treating uh, certain types of surgeries, and we want to share this with you would be just um, ridiculous. They do not have the infrastructure to support it. Local governments are critical if you're going to come in for long-term fixes. If you want to introduce your device so that they can produce it, they can distribute it, they can maintain it, and they can repair it, you have to be in a stable government uh, organization. And if you're working with tribal governments, that is not going to actually be amenable to this. So you need to be able to work within the government infrastructure that you're hoping to implement this in. And then healthcare laws. All of us are aware of the very stringent FDA regulatory processes for bringing devices to market here in the United States. If somebody were to come into the United States with a drug or a device that they thought was efficacious from another country and implement it into this country and violate our laws, they're going to go to jail and all of us would say this is the wrong thing to do. So is it the right thing for us to do on some of the medical tourism trips to pocket what we think are great surgical technologies and use them in their country without their government's permission? You may not agree with their governments. They may be a dictatorship. They may be a democracy. Uh, they may be unstable, but if you have laws in place, you need to be careful with those, especially if you look at the long-term sustainability model where you're hoping to help them with development of these technologies on their own. This is uh, not meant for you to read in its entirety, obviously. It's to demonstrate that many of us might not know that Ghana has a food and drug um, bureau, but uh, in fact, they do, and in fact, they stated in a newspaper article uh, through the, through the CEO of that organization, that it is illegal for you to bring a device, a medical device or a drug into their country without first getting approval from them. That includes medical tourism, so you're probably violating their laws if you're not clearing this with them in advance, but certainly applies to bringing in technologies that helps them with sustainability. Culture. Uh, Pauline talked to us about culture today, and culture is actually critical. If you bring in a device that is counter to that culture's understanding of how something should be treated, it's going to sit and, and be unused. And there's a, a great example that's been highly publicized. And so for any of you from Northwestern um, who know uh, Dr. Kelso, I apologize if I abbreviate this and knock down uh, a little bit of uh, their experience as far as cutting things out. But this group at Northwestern decided they wanted to apply innovating technologies to the developing world. And so their students went out and said, let's take a look and decide what it is we think, we think, is one of their biggest needs. And through the World Health Organization, they came up with the fact that about 3,500 children are born premature every day in this world. And they thought this was a great group to go after. And what they really needed to do to save lives and prevent some morbidity in these uh, young uh, neonates is to come up with an incubator that can be produced with local materials that's efficacious, it's inexpensive, and it would save lives. So they went to work and, and they built this prototype that they thought would be very, very effective. And here's a picture of it from the web that, uh, that they have available to take a look at. And they, they really did this at an inexpensive cost and it was really quite effective. So they went out on invitation to a hospital in Cape Town, South Africa. Um, and on that invitation, they brought this with them. They were really excited to show them how they could uh, help save lives in, in, their, uh, 
neonatal group. And they got off the elevator and they saw a lot of incubators piled into corners. And they started scratching their heads. Well, this doesn't make sense. These look like fully functional incubators. So they realized after a while they'd actually been brought there to be educated that the culture of the South African people was that you don't take a newborn infant and put them in this sterile environment away from the mother. They wanted no part of that. What the mothers did, uh, working with the doctors, is kangaroo mother care, where the, the infant is placed between the mother's breasts um, to keep it warm. They do continuous, as often as possible, breastfeeding to help with uh, antibody supplementation. And there was some data to show that this was efficacious, and they didn't want anything to do with the incubator. So Kelso's group realized, we're trying to implement Western uh, treatments that these people really don't want any part of. But his group was smart enough to say, we need to figure out how we can work within that developing system to give them what they want. And they realized that apnea was probably the biggest issue that was popping up in, in causing these children to die. So in fact, they came up with a way of allowing the mothers to do kangaroo care that had an apnea monitor in it so these children could be attended to if indeed they ended up having apneic events. And this proved to be very successful. So it's a great learning um, story about how culture really plays a dramatic role. And you shouldn't go out and develop something that's really not going to have any utility because you don't understand the culture of the people that you're working with. Other recent innovations that have been highly publicized, these actually were just in popular sciences, um, two of the top seven new medical innovations for developing countries. Uh, the one is actually uh, here on the left. And many of you may be familiar with, it is a prosthetic device for um, patients who have undergone an above the knee amputation. It's highly durable, it's easy to construct, and it costs $20 as opposed to some of the uh, prosthetics we have in the United States which can approach $100,000. This can be manufactured locally. Uh, they do need some assistance to get it up and running, but that is a sustainable model. The other is Solar Clave, which received lots of renown and the way Solar Clave was developed is one of these students from MIT's D laboratory happened to be helping out on a medical mission in uh, Africa and noticed that this clinic had a uh, autoclave that somebody had donated and it didn't work. And the nurses were indeed using it as a place to store their purses to make sure that they didn't lose them or have anybody take off with them. And they would take their uh, surgical instruments and ship them to a centralized center to get them sterilized because they didn't have ability to sterilize it. Now they kind of created a Mac MacGyver, if I guess this group's probably old enough to know who he is, type of device that used a discarded TV dish, a wine bottle, and a pressure cooker that would allow you to use solar energy to sterilize surgical instruments. A normal autoclave goes to 275 or 30 PSI. This goes to 250 with 15 PSI and does the same job, but instead of 15 minutes, it takes 40. So I think they had a great idea and they were great, really, really innovative about how they did that. But my only criticism of this is, do you have discarded uh, TV dishes? You might, or wine bottles around to do this with, when in fact the pressure cooker is the key because it's not electrical. You can stick it on a flame and do the same thing. So these guys got a very large prize for this and lots of recognition, but probably unnecessary. So one of our, what I want to do is give you a story about how you can implement this and how it's been done here in a very short time frame for very little money by one of our BioInnovate teams. And that's one of our fellows who goes through the process of learning how to do this. This, this is Nick uh, and Zach, Garrett and Saurav. And they are uh, a team composed of uh, MBA students, uh, medical students and engineering students who've come together to learn the innovation process. And these guys are great humanitarians, like all of you, and they really wanted to see how can we address a big need in the third world country that may also have a need here locally. So they, they went through the process of looking for unmet needs, and they realized that laparoscopic surgery is not available, or at least not sustainable, in the majority of these developing countries that we're working in. We heard Dr. Matlock talk about the fact he just got some in, but these folks who get trained in it aren't going to be able to go and use this in the regions where they're practicing. So they decided to study this, and they took a look at our current modern um, laparoscopic suites. Here you see a laparoscopic tower 
that has the monitor on top. This is not the most expensive one out now. Most of these are HD. Some are 3D. And they range in price between $50,000 to $650,000 just for that one laparoscopic tower, depending on whether it's integrated or not. You also need to have a direct lens system. You need to have a light source with fiber optic cables. You need to have a camera head. And any of you who do laparoscopic surgery, which I, I believe there's a number of you in the room, know that frequently the components fail. We have to take them apart, get new, new pieces in the operating room to make them work. If we supply these to folks in developing countries, they're not going to be able to maintain this technology. It's too complex. It's not going to be compatible with the environment that they're in. They're not operating in these same sterile, uh, clean areas oftentimes that you're seeing in this picture. So the students said, how do we take this technology and bring it here? Uh, and this is a hospital OR in Ghana. And, and that became a difficult question. And we wanted to avoid that problem that Kelso's group came up with where we said, here's our fix, and they said, this doesn't fit us. So how do you avoid that? And the key is stakeholder analysis. Ideally, we would meet with the healthcare providers in that country, and we meet with the patients in that country to make sure this is something they want. In fact, there's been a lot of criticism by um, Western surgeons and Western healthcare providers with delivery laparoscopic surgery in these countries. They think it's an advanced technology that really doesn't have a place in some of the developing countries and that we should stick with teaching them open surgery. But, it, but as uh, Dr. Price has lectured on in the past, this is not something their surgeons want. And their surgeons argue, we need stuff that can get our patients right out of the hospital so they can get back to trying to make some type of sustainable life. Nobody can attend to their crops, to their animals, uh, to help support their families. It's much more of a burden than, on them in that setting than it is on our patients here. We also saw how these hospital floors are getting overloaded with patients who are having to stay overnight, so, or sometimes several days. So laparoscopic surgery does indeed have a place if we can figure out a way to implement it. We didn't have these stakeholders to speak to for our student group, so we used our surrogate, and that's people like you, people like Dr. Price and Dr. DeVries, and we think this is a picture of you, Catherine, from uh, the past that we dug up off the internet. Um, so you've been doing this um, quite a long time. Next was to take it to uh, the investigation process. We bring our engineers into the operating room, something they don't normally get to do, and we put them to work saying, tear it apart, figure out what the surgeons are doing wrong. You have a unique perspective on this, and they're actually able to find things that we do on a day-to-day -day basis and say, I do this because this is the way I was taught to do it. And they look at it and say, well, this makes no sense. We need to do it differently. And this was actually brilliant on their part because they, they, and I'll get to it in a minute, they did find some pretty critical components that have helped us come up with a great technology uh, that I'll describe to you in a minute. They then go into the brainstorming uh, room. They spend time with the whiteboard. They do what's now oftentimes called tri-storming, which is getting out your, your uh, props and trying to piece together things that you think will actually be functional. They then move it into the prototyping lab. This is uh, Zach and Garrett. Uh, actually working on building a laparoscope. The key to this laparoscope that was that it was going to be inexpensive, that it was going to be able to be used uh, in a sustainable way in third world countries. And then on top of it, they wanted to improve on what it is we do already. Let's get rid of those cords. Surgeons in the room, laparoscopic surgery, you have the light cord, you have the insufflator cord, you have the camera cord. They're a tangled mess. They get in your way, and these guys are Gonna, what I'm going to show you in a minute is they come up with a way to get rid of all that. So now you have really easy to use device, cords are not in your way, it's inexpensive, and it's still going to give you a good quality picture in which to operate in. They then took it to the verification stage. Here you can see a picture on the screen that Garrett is next to of a handle that he's designed for this. That handle will contain everything except the monitor that you need in those big, fancy fifty to $650,000 towers to operate with. And they're going to build this and have for $40 max. And it's going to be a rechargeable battery system that can use solar energy sources to do it and not have a sustainable grid system uh, of electricity to operate with on a continuous basis. It's going to have a disposable piece that roughly costs $4 to make. So now you can take this 
device for $44 plus your iPad, and you can go operate anywhere you want to in the world. That's their plan. And we've heard that communications are everywhere. We heard Renaud talk about the fact that you can get an iPhone in the middle of Rwanda, and you can charge it, and you can use it. So now, putting this on your iPad, that surgeon who may be learning in Ghana can take an active live picture, can contact Dr. DeVries and say, can you look at this? Here's the IP address. Hop on board and tell me what I'm seeing. So we bring communications directly to the operating room. We've done it in a cost-effective way, and we've done it with pretty interesting technology. So this can work. Here they are. I'm showing them how to use a laparoscopic trainer. You can see the top is down, so there's no light inside this trainer. And these are two bioengineering students who are, are going to go in and show that their camera in a very dark setting, that costs about $4 for the, for the um, laparoscope, uh, can be functional and work. And Ray, can you hit that real quick? We have just a very short 30-second video. These guys just tested this this week. Don't make fun of their laparoscopic suturing skills. Uh, but this is in a darkened box with a laparoscope that uses the same technology as your iPhone camera. It has a CMOS chip uh, for uh, picking up video, and it has uh, an LCD light, an LED light, uh, that is just like on your iPhone in order to give you the light intensity for operating. And you can see that you can get a pretty good image. Now, if I had been brave, and, and I don't do math in public, I also decided not to give you a live feed in public. I could have given you a live feed from this laparoscope right now. You could pick up your iPhones. You can put in the IP address, and you, can, you could watch this actually while we're doing it. I decided not to quite test our technology here today by doing that. So um, this is what you can do. The problem is when you start trying to produce things for this setting, there's not a lot of money out there to help with the investment. This is a first prototype. We're going to go through several iterations. What we've done so far, what you just saw, took about $400 in total to be able to produce, plus the hours of these amazing students who've done this. So we need to look at models of helping to fund this. We're not likely going to get this from industry, but certainly I know uh, Dr. Lechman mentioned he had, what is it, $265 million? These are great places for you to invest in improving care uh, for the future. So thank you.